Hey there, I'm Lee Ullman here with some big news from the National Young Farmers Coalition. We're partnering with Heritage Radio Network on a special season of The Farm Report. It's all about what's happening with the Farm Bill and how it impacts farmers and eaters. I am growing diversified vegetables on land that's been in our family for 150 years. And so with the pandemic, gentrification, property values going up, we had to sell the land and we lost it. Join us as we uncover the untold stories behind this massive piece of legislation that shapes how we grow our food, what we eat, and so much more. The problems we have had, those are things that come from earlier Farm Bill and USDA policy, right? Like Earl Butts, get big or get out. You know, it's my responsibility to know not only what I'm eating, but then like how, how that all came to be and realize like, wow, like this piece of legislation, all this money, like it's technically something that I support as a taxpayer. While Congress debates the next Farm Bill, this is not just an invitation to listen. It's a call to action. Be part of the conversation. Subscribe to the Farm Report on Heritage Radio Network wherever you listen to podcasts. This episode is brought to you by Hearst Ranch, grass-fed beef raised on California's central coast. Now available online through Larder Meat Company. Learn more at HearstRanch.com. Hello, welcome to Cooking in Mexican A to Z. I'm Aaron Sanchez, uh, your host, along with my mother, Sala Martinez. And today we're joined by very talented Donna Abramson, who is uh, the Colustian Manager of Operations, a fantastic 76-year-old international spice and specialty food shop in Murray Hill in Manhattan. It is an unbelievable place for those who do not know. It literally boasts a collection of more than 10,000 food products from over 80 countries. And Donna, we've no- known each other for many years. My mom and I have known Donna. She was the uh, owner of a great place, a uh, restaurant and, and store called Kitchen Market, where she uh, focused on, on Mexican ingredients and f- delicious food. And we're here talking about chipotles, right? And uh, chipotles and, their, and their, all their luster and, and beauty and different ways that we can sort of explore this ingredient, uh, talk about its flavor profiles, how it's used. I think we're going to uh, also talk about a, a, a quick recipe. Uh, and then my mom is going to go into some wonderful stories and we want Donna to sort of break down uh, the finer points of the chipotle. Okay. Well, okay, let me make a little correction here. Yeah. We are covering all sorts of smoked chilies. Okay, we not, are. Not just chipotles. Yep, you're absolutely right. I, I stand corrected. We are doing a smoked chili tutorial. Exactly. Yes. I that, like that. Okay, so let's kind of start with Donna. Uh, if you don't mind uh, kind of talking about the smoked chiles and and sort of the variations and, and, and different uh, ways that you can sort of find them, how to use them, uh, how to store them. Uh, what are your thoughts about smoked chilies, Donna? Well, I've, uh, my background before being the manager of Calustians was the uh, co-owner of uh, Kitchen Market, which mm. is a Mexican grocery. And that opened in 1985 until 2007. Um, there were very few places to buy chilies in New York. Uh, there was a place, um, Casa Maneo, that yep. uh, had closed just as we were opening. Very good for us. And uh, most of the chilies that we sourced uh, came from Mexico, mm. some from California, uh, often through um, New Mexico. We, Chipotles were probably the most common smoked chilies at that time. Most the people that did know about them mostly were familiar with the canned chipotle and mm-hmm. adobo, which are chipotles in a sort of barbecue mm-hmm. sauce that you could use separately or puree them together. They spawned the uh, ubiquitous chipotle mayo that's yeah. still being served and used many 20-odd 20, 20 years later. Mm-hmm. Um, chipotle moritas are another variety. Mm-hmm. There's uh, different types of jalapenos that are smoked and dry. They have a fantastic uh, heat to them and smoke smokiness. Um, a number of years later, I'll say in the mid-90s, uh, we 
heard about a chili, a smoked chili from uh, Oaxaca called Pasilla de Oaxaca. Mm-hmm. That's that was, my entry there. <laughs> there was only one place to get them, uh, the chili guy out in uh, Bernalillo, New Mexico, and we were very excited to bring them in. Uh, Pasilla Negros are more common as a sweet, earthy uh, pasilla, but these are smoked in a very particular way in a particular village in Oaxaca. And Zarela, do you want to yeah. talk yeah, because about that? Yeah, that village gave me my, my tagline. Mm-hmm. You know, when I was doing my research for the Oaxaca book, we came upon this graduation ceremony in this little village high up in Mount Sempatepetl, which is very hard to get to. There was a graduation going on, and they invited us to the celebration that followed. And we came into this little room, and uh, they were pl- the Continental was playing on the radio, <laughs> and there were faded roses on the little oil cloth, and they sat us next to the uh, teachers. And then one of the parents stood up and said, Hago este ofrecimiento, I make this offering, porque solo no se puede compartir la vida because alone one cannot share life. Others must be there. And I think that that is one of the most beautiful sayings, and I mean, I adopted it as my tagline, alone one cannot share life. Mm -hmm. But just to put this village in context, for I don't know if you all remember about this French designer who was sued by a tribe of indigenous people from Oaxaca because they appropriated their embroidery Mm -hmm. and one so this is this little town oh wow that's awesome and they they make the chiles de pasilla de oaxaca oh i love it yeah i mean if for those who have not been to oaxaca it is probably one of the most magical places in in mexico to to really understand uh, the culture i think now it's become very popular Um, a lot of people make uh, culinary pilgrimages to oaxaca to seek out the wonderful moles they call it the land of the seven moles uh, the indigenous people, the Zapotecs, are f- a fantastic group of people. It's a matriarchal society, so it's it's no wonder that I'm here with two powerful, <laughs> strong women. Uh, so it's it's apropos that we're talking about Oaxaca. Um, so Donna, uh, I think it's important that maybe you can touch upon the different kinds of chilies. They're not always dried and smoked, and there's there's a huge gamut of fresh chilies as well. Um, one thing that most people don't realize is that. Uh, green chilies are immature chilies, and all chilies, like all peppers, bell peppers, whatever, when they're left on the vine, on the plant, will turn red. So most, uh, I'll say probably 99% of the dried chilies we see are, are chilies that were grown green. There are different names for chilies. An ancho is a poblano, a pasillo is a chilaca. Mm. Most of them have different names in their green, fresh form, and then in their dried red form. They're kept on the vine till they're red, and then they are dried. If you classic, a beautiful trip is to go out to New Mexico in the fall, and you'll see red chilies hanging off of every rooftop, drying as ristras, yeah, but as a way to preserve them uh, for the winter. Mm. Now there are uh, also in New Mexico they dehydrate green chilies, which is a very different process because they're not drying on the plant, they're picked when they're fresh, but they dehydrate them, they're called pasados, mm. and they look like a piece of leather. They don't wow. even look like a chili anymore, but when you rehydrate them, you get this amazing meaty mm. uh, chili. Well, so the drying of chilies is a way to preserve them for the future. Some chilies, by uh, because of the tradition in the region they're grown, are smoked, mm-hmm. but n- most chilies are just dried, and then there's the handfuls of chilies that are smoked, and that's their uh, application. So a little note. At the ranch, we used to do chile pasado, but what we did was that we roasted the chili first, so it had that flavor, and then hung it out to dry in the in, in the. Cu- in oh, the, roasted first. Yeah, oh, so nice. it, was, it did not stay in the plant. So, so you know, you roasted it first and then, mm. and then hung it up. And, and I have some at home, and it's like this seductive, Wonderful flavor, and I remember my comadre Lupe used to make the stew with those chilies Mm. and potatoes. Mm. It was uh, so cool. So I think, Donna, you kind of talked a little bit about the chipotle, its different iterations and, and, you know, how it could be be differentiated between the kind of jalapeno, uh, how it's it's treated. Uh, In your opinion, 
how has the popularity of smoked chilies in general exploded over the last 10 years? And are people being a little bit more adventurous with, with heat in general, with, with flavor of, of chiles? Oh, definitely. I have to say at Calusians, where I've been the, a manager for the last six years, we have a wall of chilies. So um, I've... Did you bring some along? And I did bring some chilies. I was going to say we have at least, uh, I think, two, four, uh, about eight or ten different varieties of smoked chilies. Mm -hmm. I didn't bring any chipotles, but let's see what I have. I have a smoked ghost pepper, uh -huh. the Buccilocchia, which is a delicious, very, very hot, about a million Scoville units. Mm -hmm. Very hot, but a delicious smokiness. Ooh. Uh, yeah. We also have a Burmese uh, smoked chili flakes from IMR that they roast and smoke, and it's very delicious and used a lot in the Burmese uh, cooking, both in their salads and noodles. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, this is a slightly <laughs> off, but the Urfa Bieber from Turkey oh, has yeah. a very delicious smoky flavor. It's actually... Um, fermented after they uh, mm -hmm. sun dry them, they wrap them and ferment them, and somehow it gives it a delicious, smoky, roasted flavor, and that's very popular. Middle Eastern Turkish yeah. foods are really trending right now, so that's been an incredibly popular one. We also, a little possibly off, have smoked uh, black peppercorns, so I think, mm. th and we probably have about 15, 10 to 15 varieties of smoked salts. Wow. So the smoking process, whether it stems from people liking barbecuing or mm -hmm. grilling, um, has just really exploded smoke products. Another new, th relatively new thing for us is a smoked basmati rice that's mm -hmm. used in the north of Iran. And I was, I've read how they uh, put the rice in big cloth sacks and they hang it over wood fires mm. and keep spinning it and circulating it so the smoke penetrates the uh, basmati rice that's grown in India. But then it's smoked and it's used in traditional uh, northern Iranian products. And I've actually brought a bag and I actually cooked some for Zarela and oh our own to uh, try that's really delicious. So people are in general becoming more adventurous in cooking. Uh, we have customers from all over the world, uh, but as tourists as well as um, people living in New York. Many of them are now saying, oh yeah, remember my grandmother used to make that. I yeah. want to make it when it used to be people ran away from the traditional old cooking that's coming back. And very cross-cultural yeah. people from all over, you'd see people from India that are, want to cook Mexican food, and I love it, it. you know, really, it's a big mashup there, and that's so exciting and so fantastic. Well, let's talk a little bit about chipotle, how we use it. Yeah, yeah. You know, because I, I, I mean, I remember distinctly the first time I had chipotle. Mm -hmm. You know, it was, I was, it was in the university, and they used to make these tortas ahogadas. Mm -hmm. You know, from in Veracruz, it was like this roast pork. Mm -hmm. uh, sandwiches, like a French dip, except you'd, you'd soak it in this chipotle tomato sauce. Mm -hmm. And I had, didn't make it for years and years, but 20 years later, I could make it just from memory because the flavor was fantastic. In Guadalajara, no? In Guadalajara. Yeah. And that's a one place, that's a one place uh, that, that one of the dishes that I that I just long for all the time. Yeah. But uh, normally what I do is that I make this chipotle paste, mm -hmm. you know, because uh, it's just very simple recipe. It's you get two garlic cloves in the food processor with about a, table, with about a teaspoon of salt. You puree that. You add um, like one or two teaspoons of Mexican oregano mm -hmm. that you're going to crush between your hands to release the aroma, like my mom used to say. Mm -hmm. And then one can of chipotle, so you're going to whirl all of that in and then whirl in some olive oil. Mm -hmm. And then you can put this on so many things, mayonnaise to mm -hmm. make a, the chipotle mayonnaise, mm -hmm. vinaigrette to make a chipotle vinaigrette. And, uh, you know, slather it on salmon and cook a grilled smoked salmon mm -hmm. on, top of the, on top of the stove. So yeah. anyway, so it's, it's boundlessly useful. And I use it, I mean, all the time because I have this theory that, that bacon and chipotle are good even with shit. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> they say that chipotle is the vegetarian's bacon. And, yeah. I, and I second that idea. I do. I being mean, a vegetarian. <laughs> I mean, the popularity, we were talking earlier about that, that the huge Mexican chain that's everywhere in America. 
Uh, they could have chose any dry chili to name themselves after, but they chose Chipotle, <laughs> right? So there's something to it. Uh, it's why the peel, I think, really speaks to uh, a lot of different audiences, and I think that's why it has a perfect amount of heat, and the smokiness, I, I think, reminds people of, of cooking outdoors yeah. mm-hmm. and communing. Mm-hmm. There's something that's very ephemeral that happens when you eat smoked dry chilies. Um, you know, Mom, you're talking about how you use the Chipotle. You know, in my second book, I have some, a recipe called Chipotle Love, which is sort of a, a variation of your paste. I actually roast or confit the garlic uh, mm. cloves, and then I take that residual oil and I puree that with with the uh, with a can of chipotles, cilantro, and lime zest. I actually love that oh, yeah, that combination, and I use that as a marinade well, for chicken. That, that sounds good too. Mm. Yeah. So it's but a doesn't the the lime zest get bitter, and then you have to use the sauce that same day? Yeah. Well, that's the one thing about it. You're absolutely right. That that zest. <laughs> It's not just to get, get bitter, it just perfumes it. But with the oil, it, uh, it adds a sort of like a preservative almost. It kind of it stunts that from happening. And how do you use it? I, I use it in marinades mostly. Um, uh-huh. I'll, I'll take chicken, we'll rub that, let it sit overnight, grill it, and I just think it's wonderful. The same thing, we use vinaigrettes with it very commonly. Uh, we'll mix it in mayonnaise or not. Um, or now, you know, people call it an aioli and they charge you $5 more, but it's mayonnaise at the end yeah. of the day, right? And crema or something. Yeah, or yes. crema as well. Yeah. So um, I think it's wonderful, you know, and, and it, I, th- I think for you, Donna, th- you know, you were talking about th- the different variations. There's the morita, there's the chipotle, the chipotle meco, and then, of course, the, ch- the, ch- uh, the chile pasilla de Oaxaca. And, you know, the pasilla, uh, I would like to talk a little bit more about that particular chile because I think for a lot of people, the pasilla is starting to get a lot more popular. Pasilla means, you know, small raisins or little raisins. And I think that it's called that because not only the color, but I think it also has a little really sh- some sweetness to it, no? Yeah, a nice earthy sweetness. Why don't you I... get past the spiciness? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, even with the, the uh, Pasilla Negro, mm. which is, I guess, where it starts from, mm. um, no, when people uh, come to me... Excuse me, but no. Oh, it's a different type uh, yeah, of Pasilla? Yeah, no, Pasilla Negro is more related to the ancho, mm. and it's actually... Uh, oh, no, no, not to the chilaca. It's not related at all to this. Mm-hmm. It, the pasilla is like the chilaca. Is a, a yeah. chilaca dried chilaca. Yeah. Right, dried chilaca. Dried chilaca. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so when people come asking me, oh, I want to make chili, what should I use? You know, they want to buy the American chili powder, which has all the stuff blended mm-hmm. in. And I said, no, no, you have to put at least two or three chilies. And I always suggest using pasilla or ancho as a base because mm. of that earthy sweetness that I think pasillas give. And... That combined with the smokiness and the pasilla de Oaxaca is just a delicious yeah. aroma. Well, well, you know what we do? You get do? the sweet, earthy, yeah. and then the heat, and it's fantastic. What we do is that we, we f- stuff it with a picadillo, with plantains, and, yeah. mm. and apricots, and onion and garlic. And then we s- used to serve it in a, in a, gla- in a bowl of almond soup. Yeah, because, you know, when you oh. think about it, when the Spanish conquered Mexico, it had only been 100 years since the Muslims were expelled. So a lot of the food of Spain at that time was Moorish. Yep. So, th- so this almond soup with this wonderful chili in the middle is fantastic. Yeah, Mom, and you were, you know, your restaurant, Sarelas, your namesake restaurant, which opened in 87, uh, really was, you were the pioneer of Mexican cuisine, not only in New York City, but you can argue in the country. You brought flavors and techniques uh, to the biggest food city in the world, which is New York, and you did it with unbelievable innovation, talent, technique, and, and deliciousness. Thank you, baby. And <laughs> it was, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I get stopped when people say, oh, I, your mom said that, right? I miss this and this dishes. Yeah. You know, some restaurants are lucky to have one dish that people uh, remember. You had an arsenal of dishes that people longed for, well, whether it was your creamy rice, whether it mm-hmm. was your... That's probably the one that people ask for the most, though, is the creamy rice. But your enchiladas, I mean, you were doing things like... I smell the, a business there, honey. Yeah. <laughs> the Sarela classic dishes. Yeah, and uh, it, it, it really influenced so many people, uh, and I think... You know, when, when Donna opened her, her store, I know that you guys were kind of in that same time frame. And I remember you said, uh, you have that great line that says, the folders guide at the time said that Mexican food in New York City has a striking resemblance what a howling monkey has to man. Right? The uncomfortable resemblance <laughs> that a howling monkey has, has to man. <laughs> and how much has changed, right? Wow. Yeah. And uh, you, both of you ladies have opened the door for so many chefs. 
Um, and, uh, you know, I, I recall going to Kitchen Market, Donna, and, and buying ingredients all the time from you. Um, right, and I was saying I, that uh, when our Rowan's early days as a chef in New York at uh, Cent- Centrico yeah. and Polidar, we were selling him uh, chilies and cheeses and tortillas yeah. and... Look well, how far I'm sorry, he's come. We're missed, so proud of him. You <laughs> missed El Rey. Oh, I know Rey. And you missed Isla. Yes. yes. All so my has. other ones, yeah. But I've been I'm competing with this guy for 25 years. <laughs> 30 years now. Yeah. And, and you know what? I think now we're all comfortable in our skin and where we are in life. Exactly. And, and at the end of the day, I'm carrying I'm carrying your legacy on, Mom. And uh, we're very blessed, you know, um, I think to have had a, a, a perspective of when really American regional cuisine was born. And you guys were very much part of that scene. Uh, people don't realize people like Paul Prudhomme and Larry Forgione and yourself, Donna, all these people really forge uh, the, the identity of what American regional cuisine is. And you guys were part of that movement, which is so amazing. And I really hope that the new culinary generation does not forget that. I know. And I, and I really believe that culinary schools, you know, I, I have my scholarship, the Aron Sanchez Scholarship Fund, where I send young Latino kids to culinary school here in New York, here in New York City. Um, and one of the things I think the school should teach is like sort of the birthplace of all of these culinary masters. So it's not forgotten, all the contributions yeah. and how you guys have really formed opinion uh, in the early days of, our, of this food revolution. Well, well, you know, I mean, not to brag too much, but, <laughs> but in 2004, the Department of State did a study of food trends in America. And they named seven people who had changed the way Americans eat. And I was one of them. That's awesome. Fantastic. Yeah. That's huge. As you should be. That's yeah. huge. Well, it's just, it's, it's, to me, it's so exciting to see people trying more and more Mexican things. And I think that's one of the great things about chipotles mm-hmm. is that people can have it in the refrigerator, slather it on a piece of, of salmon, grill it on chicken, you know, chicken breast. Yesterday, I've developed this technique. It's where I get the whole chicken breast and slice it. Mm-hmm. You know, butterfly, butterfly, but not, but to the bone. Mm-hmm. To, it's, it's on the bone. Yeah. And slather the, the the chipotle paste, and then cook it for forty five minutes mm. at three fifty or three seventy five, and then I just slice it and I make my mango salad. Oh yeah, of which course. Which is you know I'm, I make this I slice mangoes, and I and I put some chipotle vinaigrette, mm. cut the chicken in, in slivers, dust it in chipotle vinaigrette as well, and serve my my hira, so my sunflower salad. Yeah, I remember that. That was another one of your classic dishes that you had at your restaurant. Yeah. And, um, you know, talking about the chipotle just briefly, I think it's, it's such an important ingredient because it's canned. Yeah. So think about someone that lives in Sioux Falls, Iowa, that doesn't have a Latin neighborhood in their city and can have access to these wonderful smoked chilies that Donna so so beautifully curates at Calustian's. The canned chipotle is probably your only option, you know, yeah. to yeah. be able to have these Mexican flavors that I- I- in introduced into your kitchen. So I think it's very significant, the can chipotle, because it travels, a- you exactly. know, and I think that's really something to be said. And I think it really has been a bridge for the average American who either by hearing the name chipotle, by having chipotle mayo on a burger or a, a sandwich somewhere, thinking like, Oh, Chipotle, yeah, when they stop and think about it, that's Mexican. Oh, now I know how to do something, and how can I use that and carry that over? Wait, maybe they won't mix it with mayo. Maybe they'll make a marinade or a rub. Mm-hmm. And yeah. it's bringing them in, in introduction into the world of Mexican cooking Well, and even the Queen Elizabeth has had Chipotle chilies. Of course. Because Craig Claiborne yeah. said that Mark Lieber needed a soup to serve the queen when she went to the Reagan Ranch. Wow. And I sent him my Carlos Tralpeño, and cans of chipotle, and they served for this particular soup, wow. which was incorporated into the White House menus. So yeah. it's caldo tralpeño. And you know what? You can find this recipe on my website, <laughs> www.sarela.com, Z-A-R-E-L-A.com, for those who don't know me. <laughs> and anyway, you have myriad recipes and techniques and everything else there. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, 
I work with Gordon Ramsay, and uh, he brags that the Queen of England has his fish and chips every Friday. <laughs> so you brought it up. I thought I'd give a little shout-out to, to my compadre, my <laughs> my colleague, Gordon Ramsay. He's so uh, adorable. Oh, he's, he's great. Um, I think one thing that we kind of overlooked, guys, is how do you store the chilies once you get them from Calustians, which I'm sure all of you guys will go and patronize. Uh, it's on 33rd Street, correct? No, uh, Lexington and 28th. Sorry, 28th and Lexington. Um, so let's say when you buy the chilies and you remove them from the bag, I think some people assume because they're dry that they won't go bad on you. But actually, dry chilies can get brittle yes. and they can actually kind of lose their intensity. So, Donna, what are your thoughts of storing dry chilies once you buy them? Well, we recommend actually with chilies and all spices to keep them away from heat and light and moisture. So they can go into a Ziploc bag, into a storage container, a glass jar. You want to keep them in a, a cooler cupboard. Not It's ironic that for so many years they put spice racks above the stove, mm -hmm. which is the worst place for them. They get the condensation, the moisture, and the heat, which they don't need. A bright light also will fade the chilies, both in color, and it does detract from the uh, flavor as well. So you want to keep them... Uh, securely dry and in a cool place, not in the fridge, mm -hmm. not in the freezer. Um, because they are an agricultural product, there is the occasion where you might find uh, moths yeah. growing in them. You can throw them in the freezer mm -hmm. for a couple days, then uh, sift yeah. out any uh, moths you, you see can, on the you bottom. You can eat the moths. And yeah. yes, <laughs> one could eat them too. Yeah. But you don't have to be afraid of them. The freezer will kill them, and then you can just... Yeah. And then you will eat killed... And I and I think there's I think there's nothing wrong also with dating. If you put them in a bag, date them. Sure. So you have some you have a, an idea of when when you purchase them. I think that it's very helpful. Although you know, I have to say something, we closed the uh, kitchen market yeah. uh, 12 years ago. I found I have two things in the back of my cupboard from them. I have a bag of uh, canela, uh -huh. a Ceylon cinnamon in sticks, <clears throat> which I ground recently and was incredibly. Fragrant. Beautiful. And some chili passata, which are green chilies oh, that have I been dehydrated that. from New Mexico. They look like a piece of leather. Mm. But I pulled them out of the bag, still with our kitchen market label, and rehydrated them, and they were fantastic. But right. let me ask you something. Uh, don't you think that the smoking itself acts as a preservative, you know, for yeah. smoked chilies? You know, because I think, I, I mean, I just put pulled out all the smoked chilies I have at the home and then probably forgot them. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I had moritas that were already all, you know, like, like raisins, exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But they were aromatic and wonderful. Yeah, I think, that, I think, yeah, I think you're correct in saying that it does work as sort of a preservative or it, it sort of helps that outer, uh, outer skin of the chili to kind of stay intact. I just think it's, it's the flavor, the smokiness adds such a depth you know, I think yeah. throwing what, you know, we do, like if you're going to make braised short ribs or cook like a, a low and slow dish, like a Texas style chili, drop a couple chilies in there yeah. and then remove them after, after you braise, you know, you braise what, you know, pork or braised beef. It just gives a wonderful flavor and very easy to do. Mm -hmm. And also like when you're making a simple tomato sauce. Yeah. You know, you just pour a few in, uh, a few chipotles and then, but those you keep, yeah. those you keep in there because it's so delicious. Well, you know, I mentioned that to customers who are wrong, what you said about putting chilies in and out. When people say, oh, I'm not sure how hot I want it, they'll be looking at an Indian recipe, say, yeah. and they'll, it'll call for like, you know, 10 chilies. I said, listen, the first time you make something, if you're not sure of the heat level, put them in whole. You know, you can taste mm -hmm. it, let it sit for a little while, and then you can pull them out and you won't continue uh, yeah. getting up. The heat won't uh, develop any further. Other recipes, you're you're mm. mixing a powder or a pa paste in, but the idea of putting whole chilies in and out, I think, is uh, brilliant. Idea. Well, one of the things that I tell anybody who's cooking with chilies is to make sure that it is to your degree of comfort with the heat. There's nothing worse than eating chilies that are going to kill your palate because right. they're then so you spicy. You can't taste anything. You know that you you can't taste it. You know, so that's really really. Important. It's funny. We sell a lot of hot sauces, and every once in a while, there'll be someone who comes and says, "What's your hottest sauce? Yeah. What's on?" And I said, "Well, is this a gift, a gag gift, or are you really yeah, going to yeah. eat it?" And that, <laughs> depending, because we do have some, and they're made with just the oleo resin, the extract that are just pure heat without flavor, which is not yeah. my cup of tea. I like a good spice and a good heat, even a smoked ghost pepper, mm. uh, chipotle habanero, any of those. But I like flavor. Absolutely. So it really has to be a balance with the heat and the flavor.
This episode is brought to you by Hearst Ranch. The Hearst family has raised cattle on California's Central Coast since 1865. Today, Hearst Ranch's signature product is their 100% grass-fed, completely hormone and antibiotic-free beef. The Hearst Ranches have always treated their animals with great care. Their cattle live a completely natural existence as foragers and grazers. Well-managed grazing fertilizes the land naturally, sustains a seasonal rhythm to the ranches, and produces a remarkable meat whose flavor is the authentic taste of the American West. Hearst Ranch beef is available seasonally, May through August, in select Whole Food markets throughout California, and all year round at their retail locations in San Simeon and Paso Robles. And now, HRN listeners in Arizona, Nevada, and California can get Hearst Ranch beef delivered right to their door through Larder Meat Company. Go to lardermeatco.com and shop the 100% grass-fed box to stock your freezer with Hearst Ranch beef. That's L-A-R-D-E-R, meatco.com. Learn more about the storied history, farming practices, and conservation efforts of Hearst Ranch at hearstranch.com. Hello, this is Dave McCallan, and I'm the host of Speaking Broadly on Heritage Radio Network. Each week, I interview extraordinary women in the world of food and wine. And I've expanded this season to create Giving Broadly, a website devoted to amazing products by extraordinary women entrepreneurs. Check it out for great gifts and ways to amp up your cooking this season. That's givingbroadly.com. All right, Donna, so uh, rumor has it that you were given a moniker and a nickname in the mid-'80s. Can you share with our audience? Sure. When I was uh, a very new line cook, uh, I was working at the Harvest Restaurant with uh, Chef Bob Kincaid, who uh, just passed away a few weeks ago. I just have to say rest in peace for him. Um, I somehow got handed the jobs whenever we were making anything with chilies, any salsas. That was, this was in 1983, the early days of uh, American food with international influences. Mm -hmm. Uh, So we really, Bob was an amazing chef and we had food from really all over the world. So my nickname became Senorita Salsa, which to this day, <laughs> my girlfriends who I made in that period, we still call each other the Senoritas. Oh, I love it. And that. I'm That's Senorita real. Salsa. Like the ones I said, But I have said that now we're Senoritas. We're not Senoritas yeah. anymore. Yeah. Like the Tres Amigos. Yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> you ladies still have what you call in Spanish, pegue. Yeah. You, you still have an enormous amount of appeal. Um, so I hope so. I, of course. Um, Thank you. You know, I think one of the things that's important uh, to kind of touch upon, you know, chilies often are, are, are classified uh, by the Scoville meter, right, or the Scoville level. Uh, and basically that's the amount of capsicum or the amount of heat, right, in, in chilies inherently. Is that correct? Mm-hmm. I'm yeah. Saying? It's a, no, uh, a it, unit of measure based yeah. on uh, – it's, it's a little complicated, but um, – Chilies are put in water, and then there's a certain level of heat that's measured. Mm-hmm. Um, and so something like uh, this Turkish chili is about 35,000. The um, smoked ghost pepper is smoked ghost pepper is about a million Scoville units. It goes up from there. The Carolina Reaper, which is mm-hmm. the hottest chili that's edible, uh, for man, somewhat edible, mm. um, is I think about 30 million. Yeah. Um, which That's is pretty crazy. brutal. Yeah, you have to be pretty careful when you're handling the really hot chilies. We should probably mention that. When you go uh, into the smoke, ghost, the, the ghost peppers, the uh, scorpion, moringas, yeah. you have to be very careful how you're handling that. Yes. We had this dish at the restaurant, which was what, what was really interesting about it is that in this place of, uh, of Yucatan, they cook things twice. They might, they might boil it first or grill it. Or, and grill it, or grill it, and then boil it. So this is a particular uh, thing that was escabeche, uh, an escabeche dish from, from actually Quintana Roo. And it came with roasted peppers, roasted um, onion, roasted garlic, and one roasted habanero. And we would uh, go up to the table and say, do not eat that chili. Yeah. So and then people would, of course, eat it, and then, the, you know, it was like this 
the alarm would, would go off. <laughs> and because P Americans feel like they, the U.S. Americans feel like, like they want to get hotter and hotter. Yeah. We always just to joke around that, uh, you know, jalapenos were the gateway drug to habaneros. Yeah, totally. <laughs> gateway, absolutely. And when habaneros were, the, you know, the hottest chili that we knew. But, yeah, you start with jalapeno, you have a little guacamole, you make a little salsa fresca, and then you want more, and then you yeah. want more. It's it like really is addicting. Like, it is like a, a drug, drug. yeah. Well, yeah, well, spicy chilies release endorphins. Yeah. It's proven. You, you feel good and you and, want and more. And mucus, too. Yeah, and it's yeah. A, but it's also good to boost your immune system as well. Yeah, a lot of yeah, vitamin C, vitamin, vitamin A, very healthy. They're they're, all, they're they're good for you, and I think that's important to to for everyone to mention. If you haven't, if you have an aversion to heat or spicy food, start with the chipotle. Let that be your introduction, and then move your way up. Uh, I think it's also important to mention that chilies. That's why when you have chiles, dried chilies in a recipe, it's so hard to to designate the amount because chilies. They they vary from year to year, harvest to harvest. Maybe it didn't rain enough, or maybe it was really hot. Even on the same plant, it, yeah. chilies I mean, can have cutting, different amount of heat. Yep. They tell me that every cutting is until eight. They do eight cuttings, and each one is hotter than the other. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, and I think it, you know it's you know we're talking about pasillas, chipotles. We, we've we've talked a little bit about the spectrum of different dried chilies from around the world. You know, I I, I recently partnered with Cholula with the hot sauce. And I went to, to Jalisco, to the plant, to see how it's made. And it was very interesting to see that they, the, the, the majority of the chilies there use dry chili arbol. Yeah. That's the base, yeah, of, of, the base of, of most hot sauces is a chili arbol, which is kind of akin to a cayenne. I mean, if you were trying to associate it to something. Exactly. Um, and uh, it was very interesting to see the process, how the, how the chilies were ground, how you extract a, a sauce that's commonplace and a condiment in everyone's kitchens. Do so, they start with fresh uh, de arbols or dried? Dried, dried, dried arbols. Dried. And okay. then, you know, for one of their salsas, they put maybe uh, like one little bag of, of chili pekin, mm -hmm. uh -huh. uh, which is that dry little small chili from the, the north. The, the, mother, the, the mother, the father of all chilies. Yeah, the chili pekin. And it was very interesting to see the process. And um, I think it's, it's worth mentioning that most, most hot sauces that you see in the market are, are derived from dried chilies. Mm -hmm. I, ha I have an idea. Mm -hmm. You know, the next sauce that you do... For children, you should insist on using the Veracruz and chilies, the mm -hmm. dried chilies, because they have the comapa, which is, which you should have. I mean, I have this. I'll show it to you. It's like a little bell. It's the most floral, wonderful chili you can imagine. Mm -hmm. Plus, they also have a dried serrano chili. Yeah. Which yeah. is fantastic. Oh, we have a nice dried uh, smoked serrano. Oh, I love that. Yeah. yeah. So the, the, there's no smoke there. Yeah, but, the, the serrano chile is like the devious old uh, brother of the of the jalapeno. Yeah. It's a little yeah. spicier. <laughs> it's a little spicier. Yeah. But much more floral. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's just, it's wonderful. So that's, that's, you should tell them. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> well, I'll be, I'll get right on that, Mom. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, like anything else, hopefully the, the cost will be in line <laughs> in order for them to produce it on a, on a large scale. Um, you know, one of the ways that I use dry chilies at my restaurant, Johnny Sanchez in, in New Orleans, is, you know, you know Talking about the pasilla, for instance, I like to take my dry chiles, we, we, we de-seed them, we toast them, obviously, to release their essential oils and, and all their wonderful aroma. Then, you know, you reconstitute them. I like to reconstitute my chiles in stock as mm. opposed to water. So now you have another layer of flavor there. So I like maybe a, a, a chicken broth and then actually reconstitute, Me too. Yeah, recon reconstitute my chiles so they become pliable, they become soft, and then we'll puree those pasillas with roasted onion and garlic, and then we'll put some tamarind paste in there. Yeah. Oh, nice and that's beautiful. Yeah, so, so I have that, this little... That adds the acid. That yeah, acid and the yeah. bitterness. And and uh, so we'll have the, that sweetness and the heat from the, the, the pasilla and that really bracing acid from the tamarind. And then we use that uh, typically with lamb shoulder and adobo. You know, when, I, when I'm... Uh, <coughs> You know, when I'm making chilies, I don't always reconstitute them. Mm -hmm. Because particularly in moles and everything, what I like to do is I like to toast them. Mm -hmm. And then grind them up in the, in the food processor and use that. It's so much easier. You can, you can fry that. But toast them, then, then it's so much easier to, to incorporate into sauces. Aron, I wanted to ask you one thing. Um, 
often when I've, uh, you know, toasted and then so soaked to rehydrate uh, dry chili, say, in water, I often find the water is very bitter. Mm -hmm. So before I make the puree, I usually uh, throw away most of that water and then add a little water or stock or whatever yeah, to do so the do puree. I. So I wanted to ask you, have you noticed that or does the chicken stock kind of mask uh, yeah. some of that bitterness? That's a very good, a very good question. Yeah, I, I think the chicken stock, because it has some fat in it, I think yeah. really helps... Uh, kind of tamper down some of that bitterness, but you're right. It's it's challenging sometimes because I think when you toast the chilies, that also maybe adds to some of that bitterness or that soaking liquid. Right, if you over toast them, it absolutely. Can be yeah, too and harsh. I, and, yeah, and I think that's really important. And and what I've gone ahead and started doing is, is when I make um, when I make stocks, for instance, I like to actually toast and roast my vegetables instead sure. of and and then. And put those charred chilies and those charred vegetables yeah, in that right. stock right. instead of just putting, you know, regular mirepoix or whatever, like the French technique. So that really adds another depth of flavor. Yeah, and you know what's really hot in Mexico right now is this mole made out of ashes. Yeah. Yeah. And I just and I just tried it the other day and it was amazing. Yeah, they call them uh, sometimes you see them called chilchi moles. Uh, sometimes. No, I don't think so. This is mole de ceniza. Mole de ceniza. Yeah, and mole, I made it. The, yeah. I made it the other day. So you you actually burn. The seeds mm -hmm. and and uh -huh. toast most of the chilies burn the seeds in a tortilla, so, and it's a black, black, satiny black dish. Yeah, it's very you, popular. You you, you 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 thicken it with masa, which we're going to talk about later on with a friend of ours, mm -hmm. and it's uh it's just this wonderful thing. So a lot of this ashy, you know, in for instance in Pascuaro they. In Pasco de Michoacán, that beautiful lake town where they have the butterfly nets and mm -hmm. this the fa most fabulous Day of the Dead celebrations. And um, Pascuaro uh, has this tamales made with ashes. Mm -hmm. Wow. And it's like this amazing flavor, you know. So this smoked thing. The ashes mixed in with the uh, yeah, masa? Yeah. So yeah. in Mexico, there's been a long tradition of the smoked kind of burned f things. And it's logical because, you know, that be carbon is a nat natural anti is an, an, an antacid. Yeah, and digestive. You know, so it's yeah. a digestive. So it's understood, you know, they were so wise that they... Were yeah. Doing. We wonder some things happen by mistake, and then they're like, oh, but hey, wait. Yeah. That, that turned out pretty good. Let's, let's not make it a mistake, and let's make it... Uh, yeah, well, they, that's how they say that uh, Worcester sauce was, was invented or something like that, where they put a bunch of different dry fish and different ingredients and forgot about it, and it fermented in a kitchen, I mean, in a closet somewhere, and they tasted it, and they're like, yeah, this is pretty so good. It's a brave person that yeah, tasted it. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, and uh, I think, yeah, I think it's really important. I think that this idea of having ashy food <laughs> or burnt things is becoming very popular in other kinds of cuisines. I'm seeing a lot of high-end chefs do sauces like burnt alums, uh, which is a fancy yeah. word for, for, for yeah. onions. Yeah. Uh, um, How about that guy from uh, from San Francisco that does that burnt uh, flour bread, bread, no, bre burnt bread sauce? Yeah, the burnt bread sauce. That's very popular. I mean, so, I mean, we're, we're at, at, at its core, we're talking about smoky, you know, very deep, rich flavors. And uh, so it is a, a trend that is definitely... I think here to stay. And I, well, yeah. It's here to stay. And fortunately, you can go get all this other smoked chilies, not just chipotles, mm -hmm. but all these wonderful smoked chilies at Calustias. You know, I live there, mm -hmm. and every time Aron comes to the house, says to me, welcome to Calustians Midtown. Exactly. Thank you, Zarella. We really appreciate your loyalty and support. That's well, I just want to tell you one little sort of goodbye story, which is very sweet. The first time that I went to Oaxaca, I started talking with a mije couple. And they had their two beautiful children. They were all then up in their traditional wear. And they were talking back and forth in mije in Spanish. And uh, I asked him, what do you teach your children first? And he said, to say hello and respect their elders. Absolutely. Beautiful. I think that's a great piece of advice. We're, I'm so happy that you that you were able to join us because no, there's nobody like you for you know that knows so much about everything. Yeah. You know the people I research say to me, "Thank you for taking me into account." Gracias por tomarme en cuenta. So we thank you so much for agreeing to do this today. Para yeah. servirle. My yeah. pleasure. Thank you, and thank you for thinking of me. And uh, as I said, we've we've known each other for a long time, and it's Through great Laurie. to come. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yes, we've. Uh, it's, it's nice to come full circle still. and stay in touch all these years later. Yes. It's great. And to still be relevant uh, in our relationships. Oh, no, this is... And we're going to... I'll be better about coming to visit you. Uh, for everyone, uh, Donna Abramson has been our guest today on Cooking in Mexican from A to Z. She is the Calustian's manager of operations. Basically, she's the, the diva of all ingredients in the world. And uh, please seek her out. She's... Um, She's an in-house liaison to the food world in general. Um, Calustians, you know, opened in 1944. It, it originally uh, serviced the Armenian community. Uh, and then in the 60s, New York had a huge influx of, of Indians from India move in. And then they started to, you know, bolster their, their selection with Indian spices. And uh, as I said earlier, this shop uh, proudly boasts more than 10,000 food products from over 80 countries. Calustians on 28th and Lexington here in Manhattan is a definite uh, a definite for any foodie out there. Uh, please seek out Donna if you have any questions, uh, but not just about dry chilies, but food in general. She's a wealth of, of knowledge, um, and we are so, so blessed to have you here and reconnect. And hopefully everyone out there, we shed some light on the beautiful world of smoked chilies, how to use them, how to seek them out, their flavor profiles. This is really what we wanted to accomplish today on Cooking Mexican A to Z. I'm Maron Sanchez. I'm Sarela Martinez, and if you have any questions, you can always contact me at sarela at sarela.com. Or myself at Aron at chefaronsanchez.com. And Donna? Uh, Donna, D-O-N-A, at calustians.com. Thank you very much for listening. Um, we are more excited than ever to continue our deep dive into Mexican ingredients and cooking techniques on Heritage Radio. Thank you very much. <music> cooking in Mexican from A to Z is powered by Simple Cast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network. Food radio supported by you. For our freshest content, subscribe to our newsletter. Enter your email at the bottom of our website, heritageradionetwork.org. Connect with us on Instagram and Twitter at heritage underscore radio. You can also find us at facebook.com slash heritage radio network. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization driving conversations to make the world a better, fairer, and more delicious place. And we couldn't do it without your support from listeners like you. Want to be part of the food world's most innovative community? Subscribe to the shows you like. Tell your friends and please join the HRN family by becoming a member. Just click on the heart at the top right of our homepage. Thanks for listening. Yeah.